Good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? Hell yes. Spring is here. Hey, we got about 45 seconds. If you would stand with us, find somebody around you, give them a handshake, ask them how their weekend's going, and then when you're done, you can head back to your seat and we will start worship. Hey, good morning, church. We hope y'all are having a great day. My name's Joseph. I'm the associate pastor here. Uh, this is your, if this is your first time with us, we are so happy and glad that you're here. Um, hopefully, we'll connect with you at some point and get you a gift and get some information. But hey, man, we have a really, really busy next month. This next month is probably the busiest month of our church. So I'm gonna hand the mic to Natalie. She's our ministry resident, and she's gonna tell us what we have coming down the pike. Good morning, everyone. This Wednesday, if you are a D-Now leader or you have a host home, we are going to be having a meeting at 6.30 in the gym. Also, this year, we are going to be having an Easter egg hunt for the kids, which is gonna be on Palm Sunday, which is on the 24th. It's gonna be right after second service, and we're gonna meet down in the kids' department. Also, today was gonna be the deadline for bringing candy, but we're gonna extend it to this Wednesday. So if you want to help out and bring some candy for it, just bring it down to the kids' department and we'll take it from there. Thank you. So D Now Weekend coming up next week and kind of takes over our whole campus and we'll have uh, close to 100 students coming next week and we'll have uh, the body serving all over the place. So that'd be really cool. And then after our egg hunt, we are approaching the Easter season. And for those of you that are new to Burning Bush, um, Easter is one of our favorite things we do. If we were to have Easter here on our campus, we would be here all day having services. And so we have a neat tradition that we do. We go over to Heritage High School and we have one massive service. All of our three services come together and we have a great time of worship. So Easter Sunday, uh, we will be at Heritage High School at 10.30 a.m. And then also at 7 a.m., we will have our sunrise service in the cemetery. And I heard a rumor that Pastor Gene is leading sunrise service. Just disclaimer. Woo! Anyway, so sunrise, if you've never been, it's really cool. Uh, Easter Sunday. And hey, I want to do something a little out of the ordinary. It's not every day that we get to say this, but Pastor Dan Bailey and his wife are here this morning. Two pastors before Dennis. Can we give Dan a round of applause this morning? It's so cool. You know, Burning Bush has such a rich heritage. And so, many, uh, so much of the fruitfulness of ministry in this facility and all the things that we get to enjoy as a church comes from people like Dan and so many of the other families that came before us. So Dan, glad y'all are here today. Hey, let me pray. Eddie, can I pray for us? Is that okay? You guys stand with me. Leon's gonna start playing. I'm gonna pray for y'all and then we're gonna jump into worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for all that you're doing in our life. God, we thank you for being a church whose mission is to connect people to Jesus and to each other. So God, today would you center our hearts in worship around your word, God, so that we can know you more. God, speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Good morning. Y'all sing this out with me. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. Our God, He holds the victory. Here we go. There's joy in the house of the Lord. to 
something special for you, so I'm going to ask you to have a seat for just a moment. Jocelyn, about two years ago, we had a family come in right back there, and uh, we talked to them. We said, where are you guys from? And they said, we're from Washington. We said, wow, we don't get that very often. And over the next two years, God, in his sovereign hand, wove them into the fabric of our church. And a few weeks ago, Jocelyn came to me. She said, Joseph, I was raised in church. I was baptized as a child. But like many... I, I didn't really come into my faith or I didn't I don't feel like I really became a Christian until later in my life. And so would it be okay if I was baptized? And we said absolutely. So today dad is doing baptizing. Jocelyn, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? 
and in obedience to God's command, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to newness of life.
Jesus that we sing in this place be a throne upon your head, a crown that just sits up there. Father, let everything we do, let everything we are, the breath that we breathe that you have given us be a praise back to you. And God, I know we've been talking about Easter, and Father, we're preparing for that, that Easter resurrection service. God, my prayer is that people that come, it won't just be the, I'm, well, I'm going for Easter because it's the service I go to. But God, some point in that service, at some point between now and then, God, you speak to their hearts. And Father, that they come to know who you are. You're not just an acquaintance anymore, somebody that somebody told you about. But Father, you're a real living person in their life, the Savior of their life. God, bring them, bring them in. Father, allow us in our worship, in our word, in our praise to reflect your love to them so that they can be changed. And Father, I'll slip every week off the baptistry if we have people to baptize. Every week. Let it be overflowing. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We're going to do a new song this morning. It's going to be one that we will do at Easter. And we wanted to introduce it prior to that so that when we're at that service, y'all can sing with them. So this morning, if you learn it or if you know it, sing with Miss Liana as she leads us.
so much that you sent your son to die for us, Lord. We just pray that we would notice that, take note of that, and know that in our in our heart every day. We just pray that you'd be with the rest of the service, Lord. Pray that you would be with the pastor as he leads us. And Lord, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, I just pray that they would come to know you today, dear God. And all these things we ask in your name. Amen. When I tell people I'm a missionary, I get all kinds of questions. People ask, what kind of missionary are you? Or they want to know exactly what it is a missionary does. Or a lot of times you'll hear people say, a missionary here? You mean that's a thing? Well, there's 281 million lost people in the U.S. and Canada. So, yeah, it's a thing. But there's one question no one ever asked me, and I wish they would. No one ever asked it, where is the finish line? That's the question I want to hear. What does mission accomplish look like? You can watch videos about North American missionaries like me. You can read stories about us, you can pray for us. But don't get so caught up in the methods and minutiae of what we do that you miss the main thing. Everything you see and hear and read about us is really just a means to an end. We start churches to make Jesus known. We meet needs to make Jesus known. We move to unfamiliar places, we meet unreached people, and we attempt unrealistic things just to make Jesus known. There is nothing more important than that. Nada. Nothing at all. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And so that's what our finish line looks like. It looks like obedience, same as your finish line. <laughs> God speak, you give, we go. Everything starts with your gift, so the any I'm strong is the offering. Those gifts enable us to go places where the gospel has never been. This is where we cross our finish line. This is where, together, we make Jesus known. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Good morning to all those watching online, also at the B3 service this morning. Just a little reminder this morning about the uh, Annie Armstrong offering that goes to North American Missions. I think sometimes, you know, when you're living in the South, you know, there's a church on every corner almost, and I think we forget that in large parts of our country, there's not a lot of evangelical churches. My daughter lives out in Wyoming. You go out there, and you can go town after town, mile after mile, and you never see an evangelical church. And you get into Canada and probably even less churches there. And what the Annie Armstrong offering does is it supports North American missions. So we'll be taking up the Annie Armstrong offering during the Easter season. And just want to encourage you to uh, pray and, and give toward that. So we're in this new series called Rethink. And we've been going through the book of Philippians. And I want to begin this morning by sharing something with you from Ray Robertson, he was one of the founders of Navigators, and at one time he also worked with Billy Graham. He gives this little insight into his early life, and this is what he says. My ship, the West Virginia, docked at Pearl Harbor on December 6th, 1941. He said, a couple fellas and I were invited to a Bible study, and we went to attend that Bible study that evening. And he said, about 15 sailors sat in a circle, and the leader of our Bible study asked us to, to share our favorite verse and give a little background or comment on that verse. He said, I froze in sheer terror because I couldn't remember a single verse. He said, I was a Christian. I grew up in church. I went to church three times a week. But I could not remember a single verse. He said, finally, John 3.16 popped in my mind. He said, so I was waiting my turn to share John 3.16. And he said, eventually it came to the guy next to me. And the spotlight was kind of on him for a second. And then it was going to be on me. And that guy shared John 3.16. He said, I was just petrified. He said, I was going to be humiliated 
because in a few moments everyone would know that I could not recall even a single verse from the Bible. He said, later that night I went to bed thinking, Robinson, you are a fake. He said, at 7.55 the next morning I was awakened by the ship alarms calling us to battle stations as 360 planes of the Japanese Imperial fleet begin to attack our ship and other ships in the military installations located there at Pearl Harbor. He said, my crew and I, we raced to our machine gun emplacement. He said, there we begin to fire back at Japanese planes, except we didn't have any real ammunition. We only had blanks for the first 15 minutes of the two-hour battle. He said, we fired them, hoping maybe we'd scare off a few Japanese planes. He said, as I stood there firing fake ammunition, I thought to myself, Robinson, your whole life has been a fake. Here you are firing fake ammunition at Japanese planes. Your life as a Christian is a fake. And he said, as machine gun bullets slammed into his ship, he thought to himself, if I escape with my life, I will get serious about following Jesus. A rather stark reality, I think, that plagues the Christian community is the firing of blanks when it comes to our walk with Jesus, our relationship with Jesus. And I get it. There are a lot of activities that compete for our attention, right? I mean, entertainment lurks around every corner, There's the internet, there's TV, there's our smartphones, there's sports that cater to our every whim or demand. And we spend, a lot of times without even thinking, significant amounts of time being entertained. Have you ever noticed, how many times have you said this? Well, I just spent blah, blah, blah time on TikTok or Facebook. I just went down that rabbit hole. And we spend more time than we even plan on. And of course, we can all articulate how important and significant our relationship with Jesus Christ needs to be, but I think a lot of times it's not where it needs to be. And we're firing fake ammunition, so to speak. So why is it that so many believers are firing blanks when it comes to their walk with Jesus? Could it possibly be this? It's one of the reasons. Because maybe a large percentage, percentage of people in our country that claim to be Christian are really only believers in name only. Tom Rainier released some research recently. It's from the Cultural Research Center. And in this, it claims that 70% of Americans self-identify as Christians. So according to the latest census from the government, there are 259 million adults in the United States. So if 70% of them are Christians, that's about 179 million people. 179 million. That's a lot of people. But how many of those are really Christians? Tom Rainier attempted to quantify that, quantify who claimed that label of Christians really were Christians and how many of them were not, and he calls them crinos, Christians in name only. And he used the following criteria in his assessment. Number one, he looked at doctrinal filters. Number two, he looked at the fact whether or not these people would affirm that Jesus is the only way, the only way of salvation. When he did that, there were only 20%. Church membership was another factor he put into place. Uh, 47%, this is interesting, 47% of Americans today claim to attend church. In 2000, 24 years ago, it was 70%. That's according to Barna Research. So when he took all these assessments and put them together, Tom Rainier concluded that in the United States, the population of self-identifying Christians... 60% are crinos, Christians in name only. So that may be part of it. There are a lot of people who claim to be Christians and walk with Jesus, and really they're not. 
But secondly, I think some Christians may be shooting fake ammunition in their Christian walk because they've lost sight of their purpose. Let me ask you this. What is the purpose of your life? That's a pretty simple question. How would you fill the blank at the end of this? I am living for. How would you complete that? So we're doing this series in Philippians called Rethink. And to date in chapter 1, we've talked about rethinking our perspective. We've talked last week about rethinking how we handle struggles. And today, Paul is going to talk to us about rethinking our purpose. And so we're going to begin in verse 15 this morning. All the words will be on the screen. The verses will be on the screen. Certainly, if you have your Bibles, pull those out, your phones, whatever. But in verse 15, Paul begins to make his first point, and it's this. Don't get sidetracked from your purpose. Now remember, we left Paul last week. We left off in verse 14. He's under house arrest. He is still under house arrest. And verse 15 begins, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. We're going to come back to some of those yellow highlighted words and phrases in a moment. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. And then verse 17. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. So as I mentioned to you earlier, Paul is under house arrest. That means some other folks need to pick up the baton and preach the gospel. And many of them are doing that with a sacrificial attitude. Men like Timothy and Mark and Luke. In fact, in, he mentions that they are preaching out of goodwill and out of love in verse 16. And so while Paul is stuck in this pit stop, so to speak, there were others that saw this as an opportunity to grab attention and to grab publicity and they have less than honorable motives. Verse 15 mentions that they preached out of envy and rivalry. In verse 17, he calls them out for preaching with selfish ambition. So this latter group, while Paul is being sidelined, they want to get the glory. They want to get some attention that perhaps Paul had received. I want you to notice Paul's response to this. In verse 18. But what does it matter? The important thing is, in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. So Paul replies, I don't care. As long as the gospel is being preached, that's what matters. I don't care about their motives. As long as the gospel is being preached. Chuck Swindoll gives an interesting insight on a possible conversation that might have taken place between Paul and perhaps Luke when Luke would bring him some food. He didn't have a whole lot to eat there under house arrest. This is what he says. Luke says, Paul, you need to know that there are some well, let's just call them less than sincere people preaching out there. Not that they're spreading heresy. It just seems like they're trying to make a name for themselves. Mark thinks that they're driven by envy. Envy of you and of each other. They're actually acting like it's a big competition to see who can plant the most churches. Paul, I think it's possible some of them are actually trying to nudge you out a little while you're stuck here. And that's all the more reason we need to get you out of here as soon as possible. Paul lets out a long sigh and responds. You know what, Luke? So what if they are preaching with the wrong motives? What if they are a little too interested in themselves? So what if they're taking pot shots at me while I'm out of pocket? None of that matters. What matters? And he leans in and he looks Luke right in the eyes. Christ 
is being preached. Even more than when I was out there myself. And that alone is enough to make me rejoice. So Paul acknowledges there are those who don't have pure motives. But he says, don't worry about it. Don't get caught up in this. Going back to verse 12, he says, remember our purpose is to advance the gospel. He says, remember your purpose. Have you ever noticed how many Christians have critical and judgmental attitudes? For as long as I've been a Christ follower, I have seen that. I've listened to believers bash one another. The root of that criticism is often pride. One group thinks that they have a corner on the spiritual market and their way to do church is the only way to do church. And everyone else is not just different, they're wrong. Different approaches to ministry then become issues of right and wrong instead of being what they are. Just different ways of ministry. Different ways of fleshing out our faith. And over the years, I've listened to different forms of this kind of criticism. When I was a, Christ, uh, a, a teenager, I remember Christians were uh, bringing in new forms of worship, uh, particularly Maranatha music was coming on the scene, and people were just criticizing that to no end. Then the seeker movement appeared, and people just lobbed scathing criticism at Bill Hybels and Willow Creek Church. And then the purpose-driven movement with Rick Warren comes on the scene, and he wrote his book, The Purpose-Driven Life, and the gospel was shared with millions and millions of people. And then all the critics could say was, well, he didn't mention hell in his book. And just the criticism... And it's the easiest thing in the world to be a critic of other Christians. And I also think that's the furthest thing from God's heart. And I look at what Paul says, and he says, yeah, sure, some people are preaching Christ for goofy reasons. In fact, some of them are even trying to hurt Paul in his preaching. And he says in verse 18, what does it matter? The important thing is, is that Christ is being preached. Whether their motives are false or good motives. He says, I rejoice that Christ is being preached. And he takes the high road regarding Christians who criticize him. Now let me mention something here. Paul is not advocating for false teachers here. The preachers he is talking about here, they are preaching the gospel. They're not necessarily doing it with the right motives, but they're still preaching the gospel. So he's not advocating advocating here for false teachers. He's talking about men who are still preaching the gospel. He said, you know what? As long as the gospel is being preached, I'm fine with that. Pat Riley was regarded as one of the, or is regarded as one of the greatest coaches in NBA history. He coached the Los Angeles Lakers. He also coached the, the Miami Heat. And he had the privilege of coaching Magic Johnson, who's considered perhaps the, one of the greatest point guards of all time. And Pat Riley says, even when Magic was in middle school, that you could just tell he had an unbelievable talent and IQ for basketball. They said in middle school, he used to score like 50 points a game, and the rest of the team would score like five. And they'd still win all their games. But the problem was, the, pe- the rest of the team wasn't happy because they never got to shoot the ball, never got to score any. So he took it upon himself, even when he was in middle school and high school, to learn to be a passer and to just dish out assists and let other people score. So he worked on that, and then he went spent two years in college, and then he went into the NBA, drafted by the, the Lakers. And Pat said, when Magic came to our team, we were a good team. We had a lot of great players, but we weren't winning because everybody was playing for themselves. He said, Magic came on the scene. He went to Byron Scott, and he said, Hey, Byron, I'm going to make you the number one scorer on our team. And he did by passing him the ball. And then he went to James Worthy. He said, How come you're not an NBA all-star? He said, I'm going to make you an NBA all-star. And he began to pass the ball to James Worthy, too. And James Worthy became a perennial NBA all-star. And then Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was nearing breaking the scoring record 
which by the way, his record was just recently broke by LeBron James. But anyway, he was getting close to breaking the record that somebody else had set. And Magic Johnson told Coach Pat, he said, look, when he gets ready to break that record, I want to be the one that passes him the ball. So they were in the game, and it was coming down to the end, and it looked like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was going to break the record that night. It gets where it's one point. Magic Johnson just happened to be on the bench at the time. He checks himself in, throws his sweats down, comes into the game, takes the basketball, dribbles down the court, throws the ball to Kareem. Kareem shoots, it goes in, the record's broken. They stop the game, everybody's cheering. Magic runs over, and he jumps into the arms of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And Pat Riley said, if you look close enough, you can see the tears streaming down Magic's face because he is so happy for his teammate. My question, if that works for basketball, can it work for the church? When the gospel was preached by anyone, even with poor motives, Paul rejoiced. He wasn't soured by those who preached Christ out of selfish ambition. He had a gracious spirit. Hey, at least Christ is being preached. Rethinking our purpose is to remember, don't get sidetracked with petty things, both in our personal lives and in the lives of our church. Unfortunately, churches are known to worry more about worship styles and bylaws, and color of the walls, or carpet, and a host of less important things. Paul's not concerned with that. His purpose was that Christ would be glorified. He says, those other people, it doesn't matter as long as Christ is being preached. So that's the first one. Don't get sidetracked from your purpose. And then he mentions something else. Your purpose is knowing Christ and making him known. In verse 16, there's a little phrase there I want you to catch. Back up to verse 16. It says, The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. That word put there was a military term that talked about soldiers being stationed somewhere. My dad spent 22 years in the Air Force, and he was put or stationed in a lot of different places we spent time at bases in Texas and, and New York, and he was also at Vietnam and remotely stationed in Alaska and England and Africa and Nebraska, just a host of different places. That's where he was stationed. That's where the Air Force wanted him to be. Paul is saying, I am stationed here. I have been assigned here. Yes, I am in a, how, under house arrest, but this is where God has put me. This is where God has assigned me. So he writes with that perspective. And I can also kind of visualize this. See if you can visualize this with me. There's a Roman guard with him 24-7. That Roman guard ha has to watch Paul. Some people think that maybe he was even chained to that Roman guard. And... So that Roman guard, I'm sure they had some conversations. We talked about that last week that are referred to in verses 13 and 14. Paul probably had conversations with him regarding Jesus. But don't you think that that Roman guard might have had some curiosity about what Paul might be writing about? I mean, this guy's on death row. Now, it turned out he wasn't executed at this point in his life. But they didn't know that at this particular time. So don't you think that guard might have just kind of been looking over his shoulder to see maybe what he was writing? You know, like you do on an airplane or something when somebody breaks out their talent or tablet or laptop. And just, I wonder what they're doing. So this guard, I'm, I'm sure he's wondering, what does a person on death row write about? Is he bitter and angry because he's here unjustly? Is he scared and afraid because he doesn't know how much time he had left? So if that guard happened to be leaning over and reading, this is what he would have seen Paul write. Verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. 
So even though Paul was in these unfavorable conditions, he knew what his purpose was. He could honestly say, whether by life or by death, Christ would be exalted. He said, whether I live or whether I die, Christ is still going to be exalted. And one of the most puzzling statements here is the dilemma that Paul finds himself in when he says in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so from this point on, after he makes that statement, you can tell he's just in this dilemma. And he just kind of starts going back and forth. Verse 22, he says, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. So he says, if I stay here on the earth, that's okay, because I'll get to continue doing ministry. I'll get to continue advancing the gospel. That's what he refers to here with the words fruitful labor. Yet, what do I choose? I don't know. Because I'm torn between the two, he says in verse 23. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. In other words, I would much rather be in heaven. You know, forget all this stoning and stuff like that, not knowing where my food's coming from. I'd much rather be in heaven. But then he goes on in verse 24, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. So it's better for you folks here in Philippi that I stay here on this planet. And then he continues in verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain faithful and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. And then verse 26, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. So Paul's dilemma in his heart of hearts is he would love to be in heaven with Jesus. But he also wanted to stay on this planet and make a difference in the world by sharing the gospel. And so he's just wedged between that proverbial rock and hard place. And he didn't know which one to choose. But he also knew that he really didn't have a say in this matter. Because eventually he would go to court. Possibly he could be beheaded. But as he contemplates the outcome, whether or not he was going to be found guilty and released, or whether or not he was going to be killed, he just doesn't know which one to choose. He says, both of these options have merit. If I depart, he says in verse 23, I'll be in heaven, that's great. He says, if I stay here, I also realize that there are a lot of folks that I'm mentoring and there are hundreds of spiritual children that if I'm dead will be without their spiritual father, that hundreds of people will not have the foundation of apostle, the body of Christ will not have their foundation of apostle. But then ultimately, he seems to be convinced that it's best for him to stay. He actually says, I will remain. Now, we don't know if that's because... God supernaturally told him that, or perhaps he heard some guards talking about his court case and he got an understanding that maybe he was going to be released. But here's what's clear. This is so important. This is what's so clear. The purpose of Paul's life wasn't Paul. He was consumed with knowing Christ and making Christ known. It would have been easy for him to to question God. God, I could be out there preaching to coliseums full of people. I could be exercising my gifts. But that's, he's content. He realizes this is where he's stationed at this point. And then verse 27, he begins to close out this section with an application to his readers. If we're going to know Christ and make him known, this is what he says first of all. We need to live a life of consistency. We know Christ and we make Christ known by living consistently. This is what he says in verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. You know, one of the biggest turnoffs for people who are not Christians is when they see people who claim to be Christians, but they see duplicity. Where Christians profess one thing and live something else. When Christians claim to be part of one group, but they seem to be living in a different way. Paul says whenever this happens, regardless of the circumstances that we encounter, we need to choose 
to act consistently. You know, when you're double-minded, when you live two different ways, the, the Greek word for that is hypocrisy, and it literally means to be two-faced. Paul says, live consistently. Be the same person, whether or not you're holding a communion cup or a remote control, whether you're at a ball game or whether or not you're sitting in a church auditorium. Live consistently and represent Jesus well. And of course, the challenge is what? Satan's doing everything possible. He is alive and well, and he's trying to throw us off track. The Bible refers to him as the father of lies, the prince of darkness, Lucifer, Satan, the deceiver, the devil. He's come to destroy our lives, to do whatever he can, to, to rob you of your joy, to get you to live in your circumstances rather than with the joy of Christ. If you're a baseball fan, you're probably familiar with the San Francisco Giants home park. It has a very unique feature that no other baseball stadium has. In the right field, if you hit a ball, a home run in right field, and you hit it far enough and high enough, if it clears and goes out of the stadium, it actually lands in the ocean. Or it lands in McCovey Bay is actually what they refer to it as. So people will get in kayaks, and you, you may have seen this on TV, they'll be in kayaks, and they'll wait out in the bay just in case perhaps there's a home run hit out that day. And then if there is a ball that splashes in the water, all the kayakers paddle like crazy to get to the ball. You know, get to that $3 ball so maybe they can show it to their grandkids one day. So here's a, this was about two years ago, a scene when that happens. If you can play that video, please. Wait for it, an unexpected ending for sure. Look out below. Uh-oh. Fight is on. Did, uh, oh, look out! Oh, oh, James, oh, look come at on, James. James. You know that's a pretty good picture of our lives. Things are going smoothly. We're pursuing God and godly things and good things, and then out of nowhere, at the last second, Satan swoops in and and robs you of your prize that that you've been pursuing. By the way, I don't know if you noticed that the guy wearing the orange shirt, his name is Dave. Uh, there's a picture of him, that's, that, that's the guy there. And uh, I'm a bit concerned in my illustration that the person who represents the devil is a guy named Dave, and we have a lot of Daves and Davids in our church. <laughs> kind of unfortunate. But the Bible warns us about Satan. And... When you see something nearly in your grasp, he may come and grab it, steal it, remove it. It might be that relationship that you saw going somewhere. Maybe that positive health report that was positive, and then when you went back a few months later, it was a bad report. Might have been a promotion that you were promised. Might could be another pregnancy that ended up in another miscarriage. But part of rethinking your purpose is striving for consistency in your Christian walk, regardless of the painful circumstances that you may have to endure. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Paul says, whatever happens, that means everything. What if my spouse annoys me? Yeah, even then, you walk in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. What if the coach doesn't play my child? Even then? Yes. What if my child frustrates me? Yes. What if my boss overlooks me? Yes. What if the umpire makes a bad call? Yes. What if someone pulls out in front of me? Even then? Yes. What if my boss calls me into the office and says we're downsizing? Yes. What if my parents divorce? Yes. What if I'm diagnosed with cancer? Yes. What if my child suffers from a disease? Yes. Paul says, whatever happens, live a life of consistency. And then he gives a second application about making Christ, knowing Christ and making him known. 
We do that by living a life with a spirit of unity. I'm going to read verse 27 and then part of 28 again. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Do you hear all the references to unity there? Stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith. That term, stand firm, it's a military term that refers to when the Roman soldiers, you've probably seen this in some movies or something that go back to that time period, when they would stand in battle and they would line up in lines behind each other and they would all take their shields and they would kneel down and they would hold their shields like this all across so that all the shields were basically connected together. And then when the arrows came in, they wouldn't hit them because they would just bounce off the shields. So you just have lines and lines of Roman soldiers, one after the other, with all these shields up. Basically, it was almost impossible for an arrow to penetrate. They were all united all the way down the line. They were safe. United, they stand. They they spread out. They're going to fall. And Paul is conveying to the Christians at the church in Philippi that they are a family and that the Christian faith should reflect their unity in the face of persecution. You know, in sports, many teams obviously wear jerseys. And a lot of times the team name is on the front and your personal name is on the back. And oftentimes you'll hear a wise coach say something like, you play for the name on the front, not for the name on the back. You're not worried about personal achievements. It's about the team. There is a greater cause. Paul is applying that to the church here. We are all one team. It doesn't matter if the name on the back is Jones or Rodriguez or Washington, whatever. We're all playing for the name that's on the front, Jesus Christ. Why is Paul telling them this? Because they're being persecuted and they're being intimidated. So he says, stand firm in one spirit. While your faith is being tested on a daily basis. He said, don't worry about those who oppose you. A phrase terrified or frightened there has the idea of an inward fear caused by an external stimulus. In this particular case, it was persecution. So he says, make Christ known. Don't get sidetracked by your purpose. Let's look at a couple applications this morning, just quickly. You know, it's really easy, I think we all know this, to get sidetracked with the busyness of life and forget what's most important, and that's to live for Christ. We just get so busy that we just forget that. And the second is this. In life, inevitably, as we live life, we're going to face choices. And when you face choices, ask yourself, which of these is more Christ-like? Because here's what happens. When we do that, our personal priorities will lessen, and then he will be glorified. When we're asking what Christ wants, what Jesus wants, what God wants, then it becomes less about what we want, and those personal priorities take a back seat. Paul tells him, walk worthy of Christ. Let me just close with this. In the 2022 NFL draft, the Seattle Seahawks drafted a cornerback in the fourth round whose name was Kobe Bryant. He was named after the great basketball player, Kobe Bryant. So after the draft, he was asked by a reporter, they asked him, was there pressure in being named after one of the greatest basketball players of all time? This is what he said. I think this applies to us as we wear the name of Jesus, as we call ourselves Christians. He said, not really pressure, more of a privilege. Honestly, it just means I have to work twice twice as hard to live up to that name, and more importantly, represent him as well as I can. We have that same challenge. We're called Christians. That's the name on the front. 
we are challenged with living up to that name that we wear. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of Christ. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. and Father, I thank you for these folks that are here today. That, Father, they lost an hour of sleep. But, Father, being here is important to them. Their faith life is important. And Father, I just, I just pray for all of us. We get busy. We get sidetracked. There's so many opportunities available to us and so many things to do. I just pray for us. I pray that we be reminded of our purpose. That we're reminded of our purpose is to know Christ and make him known. Help us to be mindful of that. This week when choices present themselves, when time gets in a crunch, help us to remember what's most important. Help us to remember our purpose. I pray for our time of commitment now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please? We're going to have a time of commitment this morning. and I just want to give you an opportunity. What is God trying to teach you this morning? What does he have to say to you? You know, we're to be doers of the word, not just hearers. And we have an opportunity this morning not just to hear a message, but to think about purpose and what God has for us. So I just want to encourage you in your seats or down front here, what is God saying to you today? And perhaps he's talking to you about your faith walk. Perhaps he's talking to you about something that doesn't have anything to do with what was preached this morning. But I believe God is saying something to you this morning. As I mentioned, maybe your faith journey, maybe God's talking to you about baptism, maybe it's church membership. But just take some time this morning as we continue to worship and just ask God, what is it you want me to learn from your word today? Let's continue worshiping.
hush the sea. Oh, sing the name that hails. Sing it out. Jesus, hallelujah. Sing it with me. Sing the name that took on sin. Oh, sing the name that finished it. Jesus, hallelujah. Oh, sing the name that hushed the sea. Oh, sing the name that hushed the sea. Oh, sing the name that... Sing it out, church. Jesus, hallelujah. Oh, sing the name that took on sin. Oh, sing the name that... Jesus, hallelujah. Come on. Oh, sing the name that hushed the sea. Sweet.